Welcome back to RM Military History. Uh, today we have another guest for you, and it is Rich of the Vickers MG Collection and Research Association channel on YouTube. Um, and I'm delighted to have him. Hi, Robbie. All right? Yeah, fine. Good to see you. So the first question I'd like to ask you, Rich, is uh, tell me about the work that you do. So, um, yeah, and it, it's quite extensive. So if I ramble on, I'll apologise ahead of time. <laughs> uh, but the Vickers MG Collection and Research Association is something that I set up back in 2011 now um, as, a, as a not-for-profit company. So, uh, you know, the, the, all, all the guns and, and everything is a collection that I started building back in 1994. Wow. Um, when I bought my first Vickers, uh, arrived in 95. So this is the 25th year of, of having Vickers machine guns. Um, but I, I, I built that over, over a number of years and realized that it was getting a little bit too big, um, <laughs> probably for just me to enjoy, if that makes sense. And uh, we'd had a, a number of people visit the collection, uh, interested parties. Uh, veterans and, uh, and other people as well when it was just in in the loft in the house or mm. in the garage and it sort of realized it was a little bit too proper uh, and wanted to safeguard it for the future really so we set up this not-for-profit association um limited company appointed some directors and, and members and and we we specialize in just looking at the vickers machine gun but looking at everything to do with it uh, and that gives you um, sort of a lens, a, a different lens to look at things. So we try and look at uh, all of these different things, but through the lens of the Vickers MG. And, and it's it's interesting because, you know, the, the object of the company, um, and it's set up on charitable lines, so it's got a charitable object, is to educate and inform the general public about the use of the Vickers machine gun and machine gunnery, uh, which isn't really one of those things that the general public would think they'd need educating on um, and uh, you know, it, it probably isn't uh, but it does at least give us this lens that lets us talk about wider military history uh, you know the British Empire Commonwealth um, all of those different countries around the world that used the Vickers between 1908 when it was first invented and right up until well 2000 let's say 2000 when I certainly last heard of them still in service mm. so it, it lets us look at everything um, that you know touches that, and it also lets us look at. We try and do so um, through loads of different media. So we've got the YouTube channel. Um, I'm also uh, an academic, so I write academic papers around it. I've written some books and and helped others with with, with books as well. And then you know there's living history and, and events, some of which cross over into the into the YouTube stuff journal articles, magazine articles, um, visits. So, you know, if, if times were normal, uh, you, you're able to, to come along and visit the collection space that we've got here in Swindon as well. So, let's say, trying to look at quite a, a, a big range of, of, of subjects through a single lens and then trying to do so in lots of different ways as well. Wow, yeah, it's, um, it's amazing, like all the, the little multifacets parts of the things that you do um you know i and i watch your youtube channel it's you you wouldn't think that all that is behind it but it's really it's very impressive yeah <laughs> yeah so so the youtube channel is probably um a real sort of microcosm of that as well because we've got you know the, the rangefinder training videos where we've got people in kit and me talking to them about how to use a rangefinder uh, versus uh, one that went up recently on mending uh, you know, pins on the machine, you know, mending tripod pins um, through to me talking about particular guns, you know, looking at uh, in detail one of the guns and all its markings and stuff like that. So it is a microcosm of a little bit of everything to try and tap into all the different audiences that might exist that have a have an interest in the Vickers or something to do with it. Oh, I, think you, I think you're doing a good job. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, question two. Uh, who or what would you say has been the biggest influence on your career? So, um, yeah, it's uh, probably my granddad. Uh, so he was a Vickers machine gunner. So he was a Vickers machine gunner with 7th Cheshire in Italy. Um, and 
Uh, there's loads of reasons why he sort of got me a little bit interested in military stuff when I was sort of eight, nine, ten, as we were clearing out some big family houses and I got given medals um, and some of the other stuff because the houses had been you know, used as uh, warden posts or civil defence posts and stuff during the Second World War. And you know, the attics were still full of some of these things. So, so I got bits and pieces like that. But then we, so that got me interested in military and he was responsible for giving me that stuff in the first place. But then uh, in 94 for the 50th anniversary of, of Overlord, um, we did a few different trips to museums and, and things like that. And he, uh, we went to the Royal Marines Museum then at Southsea and he sat behind the Vickers and took it apart. And I was a little bit fascinated. So I was, I was 11 then um, and he, I'm pretty sure he hadn't seen a Vickers for certainly 49, maybe 50 years. So he wasn't a career soldier. He ended mm. in 1945 um, and, and came home in, in early 46. So it had been a long time since he touched a Vickers machine gun, yet he could remember it. So sort of fascinated by that point. And then my other um, granddad was sort of into to game and, and shooting and had a copy of Gun Mart in that had Vickers MGs for sale for 350 quid. So in, let's say, the fo following January, um, in between Christmas and, and my birthday, uh, I had the opportunity to buy one. And by my 12th birthday, I, I had a Vickers. So, so that, was, that was 25 years ago. And um, yeah, he, he passed away in 2000. Uh, it'd be his birthday um, you know, in November um 20th of november so we always put something up on our facebook page and twitter and stuff about that then maybe a picture of his medals or there's a fair few photos of him in uniform but no photos of him with the vickers other than that one in 1994 which is that moment that really started the collection going so pa was probably that original um uh, sort of uh, instigator of the idea uh, and then i went so in 1994, there was a book published called The Grand Old Lady in No Man's Land, which was a collector grade publications book. Um, uh, and I got in touch with the author, Dov Goldsmith, wrote, wrote to him via the publisher and said, look, I'm 12 years old, 13, I think I may have been by then, um, by the time I got a copy of the book and said, I've got this real interest in the Vickers, what shall I do? And, and he put me in touch with a couple of other people. Um, and I talk about talk about them a little bit more on, on one of our YouTube vids because that has evolved now to, to say that um, you know, the, the, the second edition of that or a revised edition of that book's been printed and I was really honoured to, to be one of the contributing authors to that. So it sort of bookended, forgive the pun, but that, mm. this 25 years of, um, of my collecting really uh, between getting hold of a copy of that uh, in the mid '90s to, to now, when I'm contributing as a, as, as, a, as an additional author on it as well. That's great. The, the I love that story. It's fantastic. You know, you start with a book, you end with a book. It's, it's yeah. so it's so yeah. nice. Well, I love let, it. Let's not call it the end. Robert. No, it's, it's not the it's not. Years. <laughs> it's not the there's, end. There's probably another couple of editions of that book, maybe. Yeah. Um, maybe, maybe it's not the end of things. You know, there's probably people that would like to see it end, uh, but they don't watch the YouTube channel anyway, so I'm not worried about that. No. So, um, not only, uh, you know, Dolph put me in touch with, with, with a couple of guys there, one of which was a fellow collector. The other one was a, a veteran um, who, you know, I spent a lot of time talking to then uh, to, to really try and understand a little bit more about the Vickers, but also question a lot of the things. Uh, that were happening because Dolph wrote that book, uh, let's say, to be published in the mid 90s. And most of the material that's on the market today is Australian uh, and came from Australian reserve stocks that were sold off late 80s, early 90s, right in arms, imported those all into the UK, thousands of guns. Uh, and Dolph hadn't had access to that. So there was some stuff that was out of date or, or, or not quite up together uh, in the book straight away. And that was something to really hook into and go, well, wait a minute, let me understand this a bit more. What's on the market? What am I seeing? Uh, and the internet was coming along as well. So clearly, uh, you know, 
teenager, tech, I'd say tech savvy, um, a lot less tech around then than there, were, there is now. So there's a lot less to be savvy about. But I did some work experience and a two day work experience job taught me how to write basic, basic HTML, uh, which then I went on and, and, and put a website together. So that yeah. website, uh, uh, I can't remember, ver freespace.virgin.net forward slash richard.fisher1, I think was the email address <laughs> uh, that, that existed then and uh, or the URL. And that was online in 97, 98. So really early on in, in, in the world of the net. And <laughs> well, yeah, age. and that was one of the biggest influences yeah. because you, know, we, we, you can't really pin it down to um, you know, an individual. I, I can, I can say par, um, but it was actually the influence of so many people then asking questions or getting engaged in discussion forums, you know, long yeah. live the day of discussion forums, pre-social media. Um, all of these things that meant that I could share what I was learning. People were interested. Uh, people from around the world with much more access to some of this stuff than me. So certainly the you know, the United States um, with the access to, to the to the weapons that they had at the time, uh, or the, the access that they have as as opposed to us. Um, Canada, New Zealand, Australia. All these people were different Vickers machine gun knowledge and experience that meant that I could connect to them. And there are names that I see pop up now as commenters on the YouTube channel or on the Facebook pages or Twitter even. You know, oh, wait a minute. We were talking 25 years ago or 20 years ago. And yeah. we're still talking about you know, the same stuff, how, what colour to paint the Vickers. Or, or you know, we're, we're still talking about some of the same principles and, uh, and understanding, which is great. You know, that community that helped me along the way then is really is still there in a yeah. lot of cases. I love it. It's great. The third question, uh, the biggest misconceptions or assumptions about the Vickers gun? Yeah, so there's, there's some specific ones um, and then there's some general ones. The specific I, I deal with first so because because they are in my mind and they come up quite mm. often. Um, that it was the you know the be all and end all of machine guns and it could fire a million rounds in twelve hours is wrong. Um, it you know the, w uh, Rich Willis uh, who who's uh, got in touch with me uh, through Twitter or might have been an email I can't quite remember now um, asked me those random questions about firing the Vickers and eventually. Uh, we, we worked together on writing a paper that debunked um, the myth of one million rounds fired by 10 mm -hmm. or six guns on the Somme in, in, in Highwood in 1916. Uh, because that got written in 1919 uh, and is still being written in history books today and it didn't happen. Mm. So if you look at the war diaries, which have been available since the mid 90s, um, it was 97,000 rounds across the guns, not a million so it's sort right. of order, scale of um order of magnitude out which mm. yeah that's a specific myth but that's led on to you know it will fire forever uh, and in theory because we work you know i work through the logistics of it it will mm. um keep it supplied with water and ammunition sustain fire that's what it does keep repairing the small um you know small breakages the gun isn't going to wear out yeah you know, we're still firing you know we, we we fired first world war vintage guns now and they're not wearing out anytime soon. Some of the parts break. Some have specific wear and tear, but they were just replaceable anyway. So it was you know, when when this gun was designed in the 1900s, we weren't firing. It wasn't designed to fire um, you know, tens of thousands of rounds, mm. but it eventually went through a war that um, saw it do that. But at the same time. It also saw tens of thousands of guns produced yeah. as well. So when when the Vickers was first made, it was being made in dozens, and for for a much smaller army and a much smaller you know conflict um, you know doctrine. Whereas when it eventually gets used, yeah, it gets used massively, uh, but there are many many more guns as well. So so they don't wear they don't wear out. You know, the, the one that we fire mostly, and we've put a few thousand rounds through it now. Is a, is a second world war gun um and, and that will last another 50 years yeah. we've also probably got enough spares to keep us going for for quite a long time as well um generally though uh you know i think i'd probably want to say that how machine guns were used 
is really distorted. And it's distorted by one of two things. It's distorted by either the perception before the Great War of machine guns directly supporting the infantry. So, you know, machine, a machine gun in the front line, uh, a Vickers machine gun set up on its tripod in the front line of, of a trench. And that doesn't happen. You know, second, third, while they're still in the infantry battalions, or, you know, these things have got a range of 2,000 yards, effective range, 4,500 by the Second World War, maximum range. Uh, you know, these things are sat quite a way back. They don't need to be in the front line. Yeah. So, you know, you, you stand the sort of view of somebody sat, you know, um, you know, mowing down advancing troops. It's just not the case. Yeah. Uh, you know, yes, these things happen, but it's not it's not how they were supposed to be used. They were much more akin, certainly by 1916, of barrage fire, uh, you know, over the heads of your own troops, flanking fire overhead, all of that sort yeah. of stuff, yeah. which is which is actually the art and science of machine gunnery. Mm -hmm. So we, we sort of very much talk um, more about that when we can. Yeah, there's that and famous... Also the, Sorry, there's that famous footage of of in of, of the Vickers guns. I don't know where, where it might be on the Somme, and they're doing like indirect fire, and they're yeah. re it's really they're really high. And I I always yeah. point to that sort of footage. I'm like, look, those those Vickers are being used almost like our, they're being used like artillery, aren't they? You know, they are. Mm. They're, they're being used. Um, so so one of the one of the pieces in the 1918 doctrine for the machine guns is they're to be used on tasks where artillery isn't available because they can be used as artillery. Yeah. Uh, and, and I always talk about a couple of things really that that, are, that in a way are better than using it as artillery because small arms fire doesn't explode. So there's mm. no sort of explosive bullets or anything like that. So you can't see where it's falling. And that's not great for observation of fire if you know, for you as the, as the machine gunners, you don't really know where you're hitting. But equally, it's not great for the enemy because they don't know where is being suppressed. So they don't know that their flanks are being suppressed necessarily yeah. because communications don't allow somebody to get on the radio uh, and say, yeah, we're un, un, going ahead under machine gun fire. Um, certainly not that period. You know, maybe, maybe lines, uh, telephone lines and things like that. So there are benefits to machine gun fire being used as artillery. It's much more subtle. Uh, mm. than lots of high explosive shells. Uh, one of the things that I that you may have seen is our video analysis videos where I sit there and do a little bit of a talk over of some of, um, you know, look at a photo, you know, sit there with my uh, my stylus and, and draw through, um, yep. you know, circle things. And that photo is on my list to do at some point. And, mm. and I found a little app that a late um, a sort of little uh, measurement tool protractor that enables me to work out what the angle of um the angle of fire is oh great so you can then work out what range they're firing yeah, at yeah. so if yeah. i know that that direction dial is flat mm. and i know what the tangent site is doing the angle between the two and then you get the um the angle there that will actually be able to work out what you know what size that's great is set and what range because that's you know that's the kind of geeky level of nerdiness but that's that great demands you know. of a channel like ours. yeah but it's yeah. i think it's like the the, the those little an analysis picture videos that you do you know on sky sports where they sort of analyze a goal and they'll be like oh yeah. the you know here's the winger coming in where well, you've got like here's the belt going in and here's the gunner and he's just about to fire you know it's it's reminiscent That's of that and i love it so it's, uh, i love I'm that i'm pleased you picked up on that i really like um, that you know yeah i mean i i started looking at um software that does yeah, what well, is that sort of sports analysis software? Um, but then I realised that actually a Surface tablet and a Surface pen does it. So yeah, exactly, um, I didn't yeah. need to go yeah. that far. I don't need to pause it halfway <laughs> yeah. through. Um, but yeah, it, uh, maybe uh, I, I, I'm sort of thinking about moving on to some of the videos and, and, mm. and how we do that. So maybe that software uh, will come in handy at some point. Mm, do great. Um, I love it. You're, you're absolutely right. Yeah, that, that shows how the Vickers is being used in indirect fire. Mm. Uh, we don't know what the target is. Again, we could probably find out by looking in the war diaries and understanding things a little bit more of the operational orders. Uh, but that's how the Vickers ends up being used throughout most of its life. And, and the other distortion of the view of machine gunnery and, and the Vickers is when it ends its life. In 1968 is when it goes out of service with the British Army. Um, and like I said uh, previously, you know, it stays in service 
up until the 2000s in different sort of reserve roles and things like that, particularly with, um, you know, the Indian subcontinent area and that sort of uh, world. But the, um, the 1960s use is, or, or sorry, the use of mach medium machine guns uh, is sort of forgotten about in a way, way because we just switched to general purpose machine guns, like globally. Mm. You know, the MG42 and the legacy, or the 34, the legacy that that leads with um, universal machine gun conveyor, you know, it, it just completely dominates our thinking of how machine guns should be used. And therefore the perception that the medium machine gun or the Vickers um, it's useless because it doesn't do what the adversaries were doing or um, or it doesn't do what it went to do in you know, 90 or what the L7, the FN Mag goes to do in 1968, 62, mm. when that comes in. So that distorts the view of the Vickers. And, and you know, a, a recent conversation uh, back and forth on Twitter was about, well, isn't it really heavy? So I posted up one of my favorite photos, which is the guys carrying the gun. Um, and it's like number one carrying the tripod, as you know, uh, the glamour job. Uh, oh, yeah. Number two carrying the gun. It. Number three yeah. uh, carrying ammo box and water. Number fours and five uh, carrying more ammunition. And that's based around the fifteen hundred weight truck team. Yeah. Uh, yeah. But you then get onto the universal carrier team introduced in forty three. It's just three guys. The fourth is the driver, and that's because everything's on the carrier. And if you look to how the Vickers was being used in nineteen. 36 onwards it was on it was supposed to be on a carrier but we couldn't afford as many as we wanted so we put them on 15 underweight trucks but they were the most mechanized infantry element of the division yeah. uh, so you go well yeah it's big and heavy but it doesn't have to be light the the object mm. is sustained fire yeah. if you're trying to carry it you know as they were in italy and my granddad sort of would, would tell me about you know if you're trying to carry it as a long carry with all the ammunition you need a company of infantry or a company of porters supporting you. Um, you don't just do it on its own. And you know, the, so, so that sort of distortion of, well, we went to a lighter machine gun because this was too heavy. No, we just changed our doctrine, and therefore didn't need a heavier machine gun. Yeah. Um, but to say that, you know, the, the, uh, I'm not sort of trying to portray the Vickers as something it's not. It was recognized for sort of replacement in the 30s. Um, in 1938, it was already 30 years old as a design by then. Mm. Uh, we were going to, yeah, we'd moved to the Bren gun uh, from the Lewis. And it's worth saying a Vickers and the Lewis are actually trialed at the same time. We just decided not to have the Lewis at that point, uh, partly because of the British Army's concepts of machine gunnery and what it should be. Uh, we have, we get the Lewis in 15. But the, um, yeah, so, so we, we replaced the, the Lewis with the Bren and then we replaced the, um, you know, we were looking to replace the Vickers with something like the ZGB 53 or, or, or um, you know, the Beza variant, because mm. we just wanted an air-cooled variant that could do the same yep. fire, but it couldn't. Yeah, you know, that's the challenge. At the time, we still had um, a requirement for sustained fire within the infantry division. And so when we go to the Vickers, it's be because we still want something that's capable of sitting there for a very long period of time, firing a lot of ammunition to suppress an area. Uh, and we've got to remember that 303 is easier to transport and cheaper to make than artillery shells. Mm -hmm. So if we've got a job that doesn't need lots of high explosive, there's no uh, strong point to be um, you know, blown up, or we've got you know, low impact warfare, then machine gunnery does that for you. You know, that whole sort of, Oh, you know they're dragging them up with them on the attack. It's like, God, have you actually ever, you ever tried to move a Vickers gun in a in a hurry? I have. Yeah, it's not fun. Yeah. Well, th th there's something to be said for that though, Robbie, because you know, they're, 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 say, I, I, I'll talk about the 1918 doctrine because I've just been reading it for the machine yeah, sure. gun core history work um, that, that that we're writing at the moment, and uh, the. Yeah, you know, there's there's these things called forward guns and rear guns, mm -hmm. and what we've talked about actually is the perception of the rear guns. Yeah, the forward guns. Uh, you know, so so basically, you'd end up with um, sort of a, a third being forward guns and two third being rear guns, or a third, a third, a, or the third forward, third rear, and a third reserve. So that, that's sort of how you'd split your MG company or maybe your battalion up, and, and so your forward guns would go forward with the infantry. Uh, you know, not like 
in the front line. They weren't expected to be used uh, in the attack, but they were there being moved, moved forward so that you had guns that can consolidate the position and actually take over from the infantry. Uh, uh, yeah, machine guns are infantry, that never changes, but um, you know, the, the in the First World War being a machine gun corps. So you know, it's a um, well, separate corps anyway. So you've got these machine guns, which will take over, give the infantry a breather, uh, actually, because they've just you know, taken all the attack-based casualties. You need to consolidate the position. Best way to do it, machine guns. So at that point, they are right in front. Mm. But you know, they're not being expected to be run in, set, tripod thrown down, set up, um, you know, start firing. Uh, you see all these great drills, um, and, and you'll see some of them great and not so great on our YouTube channel as, as things develop. Um, so I'm a great believer in trying to get people that don't know how to do stuff to do it rather than just um, you know, people that already know how to do Vickers drill. What's the point of just getting them yeah, to show yeah, stuff yeah. on video? There's yeah, no yeah. point. Let's, let's get people that don't know how to do it and train them and make it a genuine learning experience. Mm. Um, so you'll, you'll see them sort of run up and put the gun down, set the tripod up, you know, and start firing, which is great, but it's not how they were used. Yeah, you know, we've got the auxiliary mounts in the Great War as well, so they short little sangster mounts, yeah. um, and, and we've done some firing from, from one of those. That was quite fun uh, and remarkably stable. You know, have it, having um, you know, fired from that and also from from one of the monopods that we've got in the collection is remarkably stable yeah. uh, to to use. So, yeah, the, although let's say. I perhaps built on some of the, um, or you know, debunked my own saying about it's a misconception because it is. It, those things did happen, mm. uh, but you know, the doctrine of the day was, was was for them to move forward, consolidate a position, and then perhaps provide additional uh, flanking fire, overhead fire for the troops as they move forward in the next next phase of the attack as well. Sure. Um, I I certainly, you know, I'll be stood at the front. In, in some of those training um, you know, videos because I've run about with the Vickers a fair bit, um, you know, even just putting them on these display stands and stuff like that. It's, uh, it, it's a challenge, oh, yeah. Um, to yeah. say the least. I mean, like, poor, poor like, 15-year-old me, like, lugging that tripod around. God. <laughs> yeah, it's character building, though, isn't it? Oh, yeah, definitely. Definitely. You now know not to. Oh no no no! Yeah, I shouldn't have. I volunteered. That. It was the word. I shouldn't have volunteered. Yeah. That was that was my big mistake. <laughs> um, yeah. But but it, yeah, to be clear, it's fifty pounds, twenty five kilos in today's money. Yeah. yeah, yeah. When I sit here and like I said, you know, not for profit company. Um, I I, you know, in a, in a past life, I'm a health and safety professional. I sit here and do my manual handling risk assessments for moving stuff about the collection and writing yeah, yeah. up risk assessments to contribute. You know, um, work with the insurance. So I'm going, yeah, manual handling says not one person should lift this. You know, oh, could they not just move that from 20 kilos to 25? Because yeah. uh, that'll make life a bit easier. Um, yeah, it, it, it's it's not pleasant. And then you've got the gun sat on top um, that's 40 pounds, 20 kilos, mm -hmm. fill it with water, and you're getting nearly 50 pounds, 25 kilo yeah, again. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's all it's all hefty stuff. Heavy old yeah, It's beast. built to last. That's well, yeah. why it does last. Exactly. Yeah, you know, and uh, and that's another sort of thing about the Vickers gun. It's it's enduring, isn't it? It's an enduring image of of the British Army. You know. Um, well, yeah, it is, and yeah. it still endures today. So, so mm. yeah, enduring. You know, is on that cap badge of the Machine Gun Corps in 1915, and it stays on the cap badge of the Small Arms School Corps today. Mm. Um, yeah, it's still on the British Army's cap badge. So, or, yeah. and, and a cap badge of the British Army. I, th I think it's the coolest cat badge of the first world war it's so it's so cool and it you know when i was when i was little it's sort of when when i was looking through like first world war it's like oh there's machine guns on that one you know it's sort of it grabs your attention um it does mm. so uh fourth question and we might have you might have touched on it um the hardest most challenging part of what you do so i'm going to talk about this from the perspective of trying to educate and inform um, and then there's, there's two things that I think most historians, most people uh, trying to do that for uh, different reasons will say, and that's time and money. Um, yeah, this is uh, this is not a day job. 
Uh, you know, I do dedicate quite a lot of time to it, but it's a not-for-profit company. It doesn't pay me. Uh, so I have to balance the time requirements. And also, it's not a cheap task. No, uh, no. So you know, you've seen those videos where we're firing and, and um, suddenly you, you sort of sit sat, sat down the field, putting a load of blank through, and you're going, okay, this is great shots. And then you realise, oh, that was 50 quid's worth of blank. <laughs> yeah, okay. I've got to think about what's left up in up in the um, cabinets and how much is there and, and you know, what's what's the cash flow? And, you know, so at the moment, while well, we're, you know, say that multifaceted approach means that we can push material out onto YouTube, we can push material onto the website. Um, it does mean that when, you know, one of the main income streams for us over the last uh, three or four years has been visits. Uh, and you know, people are kind enough to come and have a look around for a few hours, have a little bit of a chat from me, um, never turns into a little bit. It's always a long chat. Uh, but it's uh, you know, several hours worth of effort for which they're then kind enough to give donations. And that's obviously all dried up at the moment. Yeah. So we've got the Patreon uh, uh, you know, pages. And, and I know, you know I had one guy comment that Patreon is the, is the sort of last bastion of the devil. Um, and, and I remember when starting this, people were saying, oh, you don't want to put stuff on the internet. Yeah, that's the last bastion of the devil. Uh, so yeah, things have moved on and, and I wouldn't say Patreon is our last bastion. We'll, we'll, we'll move to a different bastion for the, yeah. for the devil at yeah, some yeah, point. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, but, but some of that regular support is, you know, mm. is critical to carry on what we're doing because although our income streams have stopped, uh, you know, visits have physically stopped and all museums, um, and, and, and we sort of ascribe to that view that we are a bit of a museum that's very much working and practical research. Uh, so the, you know, the, the, the that bit has, has, has completely stopped as it has for everybody, museums and galleries at the moment. And we've had to step up the effort uh, to get more material online. So we're, we're sharing lots more archive content. Um, just before we were chatting now, I'm sort of transcribing the indexes for the Ordnance Board minutes mm. um, in you know, 1938, reading about all the different developments of bombs, aircraft, which is of no interest to me whatsoever. But because there'll be a tiny bit of Vickers stuff you know, in sandwiched between a 250 pound bomb trial and, I don't know, bur petrol burning on the sea trial, um, there'll be a mention of the different kind of foul yeah. that should be used in a dial site box. Um, oh. So, yeah, so that, that that's the sort of level of detail we're going. But we're sharing a lot of that stuff because that educate and inform mm. can't just be about my interpretation of things. That's about providing people with the raw materials for them to do their interpretation and understanding of the history as well. Yeah. Uh, because otherwise, if people just listen to historians all the time, they'll just get the historian's perspective and point of view, won't they? So, yeah, yeah. so by putting that primary material on, uh, we are very much trying to share a lot of more small arms material because we get asked uh, for a lot of information about a lot of different weapons. You know, there's no equivalent for Lewis guns on the internet. There's no equivalent mm. for Bren guns. I did write a brain gun website some years ago, but um, that dropped off. Uh, you know, it wasn't something that interested me sufficiently to, to warrant the additional effort. Yeah. Um, there's no equivalent website for Maxims, German stuff or anything like that. So we're, we're trying to make sure that we do provide, where we see that stuff as incidental, we still provide the raw material uh, to enable people to research it if they want to. Um, and maybe one day, maybe one day there'll be this um, view that somebody comes along and starts to write bits of our website on these other weapons as well. Uh, but, you know, until that time, there'll just be the raw material like that. Mm. So that's our key income generator as well. Not, not like purely archive material, but people that are willing to support us on a regular basis. Um, yeah. And hopefully they, they, they sort of see that there's a benefit from that um, and get those. So, you know, one example is that, say, repairing the tripod pins was a somebody asked for that information yeah. uh so you know ask and we'll try and you know answer mm. it as best we can straight after this you know i'm i'm doing a, a q a q a video where we've had some some questions from different people like how much ammunition is carried with the vickers how long do the barrels last things like that yeah, yeah. that you can't find out anywhere and, and youtube and, and video mm. seems to be the best way of getting it from my head and it, um yeah, definitely. Over, over to people at the moment mm. so yeah it's mm. time and and money so you know as sort of a 
it's a common uh, theme. Advertorial there um, yeah. about you know income streams at the moment for Definitely. not just the Vickers Association, but you know, museums and galleries in general. Mm. Uh, yeah. You know, certainly need that support because we're we're sort of the go-to people when you've got questions a lot of the oh, time. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's how we sort of got chatting, really, wasn't it? I, yeah, that's right. Yeah, I wanted to know about the vicars in the Korean War, and yeah, that's right. Who uh, who else to ask? You know, and that's yeah. a great thing about <laughs> it's a great thing about people who have a niche and things like that in the in the history world, at, at least. And it, you know, all very open book. You know, if you don't know something. You can ask these people, and nine times out of ten, they'll go above and beyond to find things out for you. Yeah, you know, I think it's fantastic. You know, it's an, it's yeah, an... we've stopped going above and beyond unless you pay. Well, okay, um, fair enough. <laughs> there's too many people asking stuff that is above and beyond. It's too much, yeah. Um, you know, can can you tell me how quickly it takes to boil a you know boil a pint of water oh, um, in the Vickers barrier? It's like, yeah, well, yeah. I can tell you how much it costs to. Uh, <laughs> no, that, that, that's really yeah. mercenary, um, yeah. and it's not meant to, but it but it does sort of. There's a lot of people sat at home at the moment trying to research stuff. Yeah. Um, and there's only a few. So, so I feel it. It's like, you know, I could spend all day, every day, answering random yeah. questions about machine guns. Mm -hmm. Some of those will be the same questions eventually. You know, they're, they're going to be wrong. There's a lot of questions to be answered. But um, if, if, we were, if we were chasing everything, we'd start doing brain gun stuff. We could do a little bit of that, but not, but not too much. You know, we'd mm -hmm. start doing... Um, a lot, of, a lot of more in-depth, wider weapons. But, but at the end of the day, we've got boundaries, we've got limits, yeah. um, and I nearly said we've got standards, but people would deny that. <laughs> um, but yeah, we've got boundaries and limits, and and they're wide. Yeah, they, yeah, they yeah. are really wide. We're just looking at the vicars, uh, so yeah, we have to stop somewhere. Mm. Um, but it it does always challenge us as well, and I say us. Because it's not just me. There's a few people that, um, you know, again, when when life is normal, you know, come here and help on working days, uh, and you know, work through things, get restorations done, and and you know, do some research as well. Uh, you know, it, it, it it's other people's time and money that they're investing in this as well. So we want to try and make it um, as as good as possible for everybody. So next question: um, Why do you think the Vickers gun is so beloved? I think I probably touched on touched on it a little bit, um, but I think it's staying power, isn't it? it, it and it is it's bizarre. So I will say it's bizarre um, because I get it. You know, don't, don't get me wrong. I get that it's beloved. It's this piece of marvelous engineering, mm -hmm. um, and it's a piece of engineering that so many people had experience of. You didn't have to be in one of the machine gun battalions. Uh, in the Second World War, you didn't have to be in a machine gun corps in the First World War, uh, but because you'd have known it was there. And and actually, you, know, you can probably you know, maybe not so much now, but the, every every regimental museum had a Vickers in it at some point. So everybody's yeah. seen that. Every, it's iconic, you know. And, and iconic items do get beloved as a result. So, you know, the, the, I don't. It's, it's not it's not necessarily a war winning weapon. Um, other you know like the spitfire or mm. um I, I don't know sherman tank and things like that it's not necessarily those you know um let's say the, 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 these big iconic items like that uh, but at least it is something that we can um I, i'd put it just below that pedestal mm. really because it's iconic enough uh, it tells the same stories as well of industry. Uh, it tells the same stories of training and people and um, you know, development. It outlasts many of those other iconic uh, designs as well. Yeah. Uh, the exception might be the Bren gun, but the Bren gun has an added advantage that everybody used it. Uh, yeah, yeah, so yeah. literally, you know, you went to recruit trading, you got trained on the Bren gun. And then the other thing that, you know, now we see with the Bren gun with veterans, you know, sadly falling away. Um, cadet, people that used it in cadets. There's still this living memory of the Bren gun usage. There's not that much living memory of Vickers gun usage about. So it, it, I think it's in an interesting um, uh, period, really, where it sets a standard for, for machine gunnery um, and all of the 
art and science and machine gunnery that we have today in the armed forces is developed from the vickers you know yeah. there, there, there's uh, it's so much that we carry over into the sustained fire role for the general purpose machine gun there's so much that's carried over into mobility lessons um you know, how do you move heavy things and lots of ammunition from one place to another there's there's a lot that carries over into infrastructure and industry as well so it's I say it sits there as this iconic item and compounding that unlike the spitfire and sherman tank you can fit it in the living room so there's yeah. a lot of people out there with them um mm -hmm. yeah and actually for, for quite a long period and i'd say that period's possibly stopped now uh but they were affordable yeah you know, say i bought that for 350 pounds in the mid 90s uh, there was a lot of them around. You'd go to the military affairs, and there'd be a stack of transit cases um, full of Vickers machine guns yeah, yeah. at 350, 500, and eventually more. Um, <clears throat> so they were affordable. You can have them in the living room. Uh, we've, um, I don't know, uh, I, I, I almost, I hesitate to say rescued, um, repatriated some from living yeah, yeah. rooms, uh, and and uh, you know we, we, all, we all you know sort of shout out if i may uh, always on the lookout for, for more yeah. and if people you know don't want it sat in their living room but want to see it being used then please get in touch um because you know it will live with friends mm. uh, no definitely there, there are quite yeah. there are quite quite a few here and other people will see it and understand it as well so not all the guns that are in the collection are um owned by the association um and others you know have been donated gone actually or passed away or whatever uh yeah they, they've been donated in so that others can learn from them and, and that's the legacy of the association as it stands mm. uh, but it, it it is say it's one of those things that is affordable um yeah. is iconic so once you put those two together you're going to get a beloved item and yeah, yeah. say so definitely there are so many tales not enough tales of mm. machine guns in use um i i you know, today, you know, many of the sort of popular history uh, books and things like that do miss out on talking about machine gunnery um, mm. and, and the role of the Vickers uh, because, I don't know, because it is a little bit abstract. It wasn't in the yeah. firefight, you know, certainly in the Second World War. Um, it was buzzing around on, on carriers, um, being moved about on carriers, not necessarily being fired from them, mm. but it was being uh, buzzing around on them a divisional battalion uh so say a little bit detached uh, from the firefight a little bit more complicated to understand uh and only five regiments were machine gun battalions so you've got a limited number of people and veterans to talk to about them so it's yeah it, it's possibly not enough tales of daring do with the vicars uh there are a few uh we've tried to tell a few of those yeah. Yeah. um through the through the youtube channel definitely mm. uh, you know some great stuff that's come up uh you know from twitter Ooh, yeah. uh yeah, again yeah. is some of those challenges to us you mm. know, can you help us understand how this works so yeah. we've tried you know and I mean, the, the one would... where um you know so... go on no no i, I was gonna yeah. say the firing from the hip that that one yeah. really sticks yeah. out for me yeah, mm. Sergeant Longhurst and his military medal. So thanks to you know Ernest Malley on Twitter for for even just mentioning that, just <laughs> sowing that seed yeah. uh, that eventually turned into a chiropractor appointment for me. Um, <laughs> oh, yeah, yes. I was booked. I was booked anyway. It was fine. Oh, good, good. Um, he just asked what I've been doing all week. <laughs> yeah. He's like, oh yeah, firing machine guns from the hip. Oh, little machine guns. No, big machine guns. It's worthwhile. Um, it was very worthwhile because it was really interesting to understand how it worked. Mm -hmm. And then on the contrast, the one we did straight after that was firing it from a wire, the ghost gun um, of Monte Cassino, which was much more relaxing and, mm. and less painful. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah, it's it's you know, these snippets of information that come up yeah. uh, that make it such a diverse and iconic gun as mm. well, actually. No, no, yeah, couldn't agree more. You know, it's, it yeah. is, it is, it's got that look you know, it, it looks, you know, by sort of World War Two, it does look a little bit antiquated, but not really. It's got, it's in this sort of brilliant, like it's in a world of its own, I think. It said, so it's an Edwardian design. So mm. then, you know, 1906 is the first light pattern maxim. And then 1908 
you know, the Vickers is the 1908 model um, yeah. uh, uh, for their commercial guns, the Class C. And so it's a proper Edwardian design. It's really interesting that then from a, from a design culture perspective, you know, somebody can look at how that lasts. You know, what other things of Edwardian design are still hanging about in the British Army in, in the 1960s? Mm. I've got a great book on the British Army weapons and equipment published in 1968. And it's sort of like tactical nuclear weapons are three or four pages after the Vickers machine gun. <laughs> well, you know, that, that sort of blows your mind a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Um, That's great, though. But it's those, it's those classic design lines mm. and everything like that, that if you ask somebody to draw a machine gun on a tripod, they're probably going to draw a Vickers machine gun at some point. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. No, you're right. You really are. Um, you know, and long may its legacy continue. You know, I don't think... Well, it, so, yeah, yeah. it's a um, 100 years of British Army adoption. No, sorry, 110 years of British Army adoption in 2022. Wow. Uh, you know, so, um, you know, we, we'll put the effort in and, and do something to, to commemorate that use. Definitely. Uh, it, it's also the 100 years of the disbandment of the Machine Gun Corps that year as well. So, so we're looking at quite a programme um, of events that will mm. uh, draw out uh, the machine gunnery side. Uh, yeah. of that actually what's the legacy of all that and uh hopefully we'll be working with some national and, and regimental museums mm. as 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 well as doing some commemorative shoots and um lots of different things uh planned for that that we're working through at the moment but the yeah the idea is that we you know commemorate that the legacy that the machine gun corps gives us and that legacy is actually built around the vicars so yeah. 100 years of machine gun corps disbandment, 110 years of the Vickers and, you know, from British Army service. It means, means that it's quite a uh, sort of important year for an association such as ours to, to start to you know, get busy. Yeah. Mm, no, yeah. And busier. Busier. Yeah. And yeah. just for me, it's it's sort of it's I think it's a bug. You know, when when I stupidly volunteered to be number one gunner that one year at Military Odyssey, I didn't know how much I'd fall in love with the gun. And you, you really sort of, you know, I, I booked that same gun out every year just because we had to use a Vickers. We were, we were a First World War group. You have to have one. You know, it's expected. But yep. I, I got to know it and it got to know me. And in a sort of way, you have this odd synergy with it. And you, you know, all, okay, I know I might get a jam now because I know how this gun works and how it sort of feeds and all that sort of thing. You, you get this really... You get this all this really sort of bond with the weapon. It's it's peculiar. They're all unique. That's probably the mm. gun that we had to mend when we had it victory show the following weekend. <laughs> it might have been actually. Um, but yeah, it's <laughs> um it's it's uh because they came from the same guy. Um but the the uh yeah you do sort of form this understanding. Mm. I don't think it's a, a, a I don't have a bond. They do bite me every time I touch it. Um, yeah, you know, yeah. The, the number of sort of cuts and bruises. I sort of come up here and do some. Oh yeah, you know, yeah. I've had that. Mending. Yeah. You go. What, mm -hmm. How did I do that? Why haven't? Why does that knuckle not work anymore? Or why isn't mm -hmm. it there? Um, where's the <laughs> oh, skin gosh. gone? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so yeah, know. it's yeah. it's one of those things where you do uh, you, you do sort of form a bond understanding, and that's uh, I think um, one of, one of the sort of feedback points that I get is people listen to us firing the guns. Uh, and they go, well, I'm firing really slow. Um, and there's, a, there's two reasons for that. One is because you want to get a point, the point across that it's not a fast firing machine gun. Oh. The other, well, there's three reasons. So that's the first one. The second is coming back to my mercenary point, this is expensive. The third um, is the fact that uh, we want you to be able to realize that five rounds is not a burst. Now that's becoming, that's going to become my hashtag t-shirts with it five yeah. to eight rounds is not a burst yeah 25 rounds is the burst from the vickers machine gun and actually you know, to sit there and listen to 25 rounds fire you, you need it running a little bit slowly um but that is sustained fire you know machine gun bursts mm -hmm. you know hashtag mm -hmm. five rounds is not a burst yeah um, definitely it, it's yeah so, so we have them running slow you can hear it you can hear when things go wrong and you've got to remember um, that if I can just this here, this cock in this crank handle um, tells you everything that's going wrong with the gun. I mean, you'll know that from firing it. Yeah, so yeah. there we go. Uh, yeah, yeah. On, on here. So when this stops and, and you're seeing the videos that we've done where we've deliberately put stoppages in or we're balancing springs or muzzle attachments, 
when this stops all the way back, it's got four positions, it tells you exactly what's gone wrong with the gun. So if the gun can talk to you in that way, mm -hmm. then that, that's no excuse to talk to guns. You know, yeah. they, they, they won't answer back unless <laughs> you're firing them. Yeah. But at least it can tell you something about it in a creative character. Mm. Um, and they do have character. I think they it's do. Great. Yeah, no, I think they they really are. They're just great guns, aren't they? Yeah, yeah we, we've got we've got guns with character. So, so two yeah. of our um, really early First World War guns, so uh, March and May 1915, they're like the first thousand made. Uh, yeah, one's got battle damage. You know, it's had bits welded up wow. on it. Um, mm. One of these guns, I think it's this one, uh, has um, a damaged rear cross piece where it's been dropped. Um, you know, it... it it's all sort of related mm. material. Now that this, let's say, it is this gun, um, has a sort of some some stories to tell because of that. Yeah, you know, we know that it's um, only a few serial numbers from one that's been excavated in Arnhem. Uh, it's got drop. It's got damage that relates to para dropping. Mm. So when you put it in a um, you know a, yeah, yeah. A, a drop canister or in a valise and you drop it out of an aircraft, the rear cross pieces break. Um, we know we know some of these things that we can start to tell because what you can't do, and sadly, otherwise I think I'd be able to make a lot more money if I just had a ledger that told you where every gun went, which units had it, um, who used it, and you know, what happened to it afterwards. Because mm. that's the kind of thing, when somebody buys a classic car, they want to know. They yeah, go through yeah, the yeah. book, they want to find out who owned it, who used it, where did it go? Oh, it was in a garage near me. Mm. Um, they want to know all that stuff. Sadly, with machine guns, we can't. We do have quite a ledger, uh, a, quite a, a database where we pick things up from um, war diaries. You know, not you know, war diaries don't record when new guns arrive, but sometimes the uh, you know, the, the part towards something does. Mm -hmm. uh, so if we see that, highlight it, add it to the database. Definitely. There's about 120,000 Vickers guns um, built. Mm -hmm. uh, we don't know how many are surviving. We don't know how many are out there. Uh, but you know, we'd like to, uh, but we, we we can we can try and find out as much as possible um, from, from those that kept decent records. The Canadians were great. So if your gun was ever in service with the Canadians, we can probably find out a little bit more about it. Yeah. Uh, but the, yeah, but British Army, no chance. We can tell you when it left the factory um, and we can have a guess about its life if it's got markings and stuff on it, but yeah. we can't tell you anything more than that. Oh, there you go. So the last question I'd like to ask is, uh, tell me what it means to you to be a, a historian, a, a preservationist, a researcher. Yeah, I don't know what I am, really. Yeah, do it's I? hard to pin, um, isn't it? <laughs> it? It is, of all trades, master and none. Um, yeah, my, my, my background and my um, <laughs> my background and my qualifications are in waste management and pollution control. So, you know, this is surplus, isn't it? So I suppose mm. I'm qualified to deal with it. Um, but you know, I, I did some of that in the defense industry and that's my day job as an academic is dealing with defense industry marketing and, and things like that. So although I, although I am an academic, um, you know, and, and my students will sometimes go, why are you talking to me about Vickers machine guns? Um, it's because at heart, I'm, I am that sort of history. It's a story. metaphor, okay? <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, it's not. It's a machine oh. gun sat in front of them, and I'm trying to tell them how it works. <laughs> um, yeah, I've stopped. I've stopped trying to use metaphors with them. Um, uh, thankfully, they're all military or civil service students that just get you know busman's holiday for them. Mm, mm, but yeah. it, it, sometimes it works as you know, it works uh, as a comparator. Uh, but it it does mean quite a lot to be able to you know, get that feedback from people and, and help them understand something that uh, they might not understand, you know, in, in all seriousness, nobody's expecting you to be a specialist. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, it's uh, um, 144 hours for the basic machine gun course uh, and another, oh, I mean. it's another 78 for platoon commanders. Mm. So if you want that level of level of knowledge, you know, all the manuals and everything are there and we really want to, um, replicate you know, so, so hopefully you've seen our rangefinder training bids we want to replicate the whole machine gun course at some point so there's like 250 hours mm. um of teaching time mm. um including all the live fire and field fire and stuff as well you know it's entirely possible do not get put off by the fact that we're talking about machine guns firing in the uk and things like that it's entirely feasible mm. and possible it's just funding um time mm. and, and that sort of thing um but yeah, so it's a big subject to try and comprehend. And most people don't 
want to know all of it. Why would you know? Why do you? Mm. you don't need to know all of it? Um, some people just want to understand one specific thing. Uh, so, say, you know, how did the ghost gun work? You know, what is the ghost gun? So, we scurry off, get that feedback from somebody, and going, oh, okay, that that looks a lot more difficult than it read in Maj Delaney's book. Um, you know, well, yeah, it, because we had to put wire, and, and, and it would have been even more difficult if you were trying to do it on the side of Monte Cassino. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah, go on. <laughs> yeah, it, we did it in a field in Wiltshire, yeah. and it was tricky. Um, it, it, you try and do it on the side of a mountain in Italy under enemy fire and observation, probably in the dark. These these are why you know people get um, gallantry awards and stuff like that. Um, you know, Longhurst is a great example of, mm. of getting that feedback then from Ernest Malley, um, getting the feedback from the guy that asked about uh, the ghost going again, that's helped. And, and that's yeah. the satisfaction, really. Yeah. Um, you know, uh, and there is a, a slightly, you know, I, I, I spend as much time as possibly can doing this thing um, because it is that sort of evolution of the hobby. And it is an evolved, it is an evolved hobby. You say, I, I, I put down that the hobby. There was this crossover between my hobby and this, whatever it is, um, mm. for for a few or four few years, probably until two thousand and fifteen, when I went came out of industry and went into academia, uh, and then realised that it's there's a lot more to be learned from this stuff, and there's a lot more to be taught. Uh, about it so the, you know, the the concept of writing um you know, new material uh looking at things through different angles different lenses getting people you know I'll, I'll engage with people as much as i possibly can if i stop engaging it's probably because i've run out of time um or run out of information and yeah. at that point i'm quite happy to say okay i, I can't yeah you know, i can't answer mm. that question mm. i don't i try not to make stuff up um well not knowingly um Sometimes memories get confused and muddled, and I can remember it's in that book somewhere over there, but I haven't mm. read that book over there for twenty years. <laughs> uh, so, you know, I might get it wrong. Yeah. Uh, but it does, uh, you know, it does sort of take over, and so feedback is is really valuable. Um, you know, I get upset when uh, you know, there's no comments. Why is there no comments? Um, and I know from marketing speak. Well, if there's no comments, nobody's annoyed with you for a start. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, and but, but sometimes some of the best sort of feedback is annoyance isn't it it's like no you know it's just too heavy you know some of the some of the greatest um most satisfying things where somebody goes oh that was interesting mm -hmm. um, and, and you will have it you know, you'll, you'll have your youtube videos where you're not getting any comments at all and and, and you know why not well they're yeah. happy yeah. well I, I don't i want to know they're happy tell me mm. um you know, mm. it, it's very frustrating yeah, uh, yeah. And it, but it's extremely satisfying when somebody says, "Yeah, I understand. You've you've clarified that for yeah. me." Um, yeah, going back to the misconceptions. Yeah, this water jacket does not pump water. Yeah, there is a hose; it all comes out, <laughs> as you'll know. Yeah. Yeah, it comes out, and you have to manually yeah. refill it. I'm trying to move yeah, my yeah, finger yeah. in the right direction here. You, so you have to yeah, manually yeah. refill it through this valve, this sort of filler cap up here. It mm -hmm. doesn't pump out. You know, there's no cycle. No. Um, yeah. Number of people that have sort of come and go. Uh, does it pump water from the can? No. Mm -hmm. No, it doesn't. Oh. Oh, well, that's interesting. So yeah. you had to manually refill it. Yeah, yeah. It was just another thing to do. Yeah. Um, and you start to mm -hmm. have this, because because if we were designing this today, you would pump it. You, you'd have yeah, this you would. You'd have like a, system, a manual it? pump. Yeah. Um, you know, so, but you, it helps you understand the complexity of the system and then realize why you need 144 hours basic training yeah, yeah, um, yeah. to work to work with vicars mm. Mm. yeah and it's it's you know if i'd have known that i'd have never volunteered to use a bloody thing <laughs> you know well also you'd have never filled it with water well no uh, you, no yeah. um they're heavier yeah <laughs> yeah i'm guaranteed Definitely. they're heavier they're hotter Mm -hmm. you know, if you fill it with water and then start firing rounds through it, they're yeah. a lot hotter to Definitely. deal with yeah. and pick up and move. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. And, and you sort of go, well, what, what's that bit for? Yeah, that's to protect your hands, yeah. to protect your skin. 
Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the first World War One get little. If, if you've got the right kit on them, they've got nice little leather handles that make life much easier. Uh, but uh, yeah, so I didn't have that. Stuff, that's going over <laughs> your shoulder, and and you sort of pick it up and put it on your shoulder. And this is why the physical research, you know, I say physical research slash living history, um, mm. slash reenactment, because they're all the same thing. It's just different. Yeah. Well, yeah. You, know, you want to go to one of Woody's videos to debate the terms, but for, <laughs> for me, those three those three things are the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, and that physical research makes you realize that when it's full of water and it's boiled, you need to think about picking it up and moving it yeah, because yeah. you pick it up, this, you know, this bit here that doesn't have the canvas jacket on is by your ear mm -hmm. that and that sort of just gets you there and you go oh yes it's hot yeah. um you know yeah. uh, uh where's, where's that? this one here is all the way along that's the australians because the australians are genius you know they put it all the way along thinking yeah, yeah, absolutely yeah. they use their um, heads <laughs> yeah. yeah they're both asbestos lines so you don't eat them um mm -hmm. but the yeah the the uh, they used the heads, they put it all the way along. They also put a little loop on the middle of it so you could put rifle straps between that and the cross piece so you can carry it as a backpack. Who knew? Um, yeah, clever stuff. Uh, yeah. And that's one of the things about the Vickers being in service for so long. There's ingenuity that comes along constantly because you can't change the basic gun, um, but you can change lots of things around it. So you see it go from, you know. 2,700 yards to 4,500 yards with the ammunition and some sights change. You mm -hmm. see the Australians put it on, um, you know, Bren gun tripods because they're trying to do lightweight things with it through the jungle because they don't want to carry the heavy thing. Uh, you see different mounts, different monopods. You mm. see the, the the basic, you know, uh, tripod, the Mark IV mountain, stays the same throughout the entire service. There's a Mark V that's lighter, but it's not as stable, uh, but it was introduced for the Maxim in 1906. So, yeah, that's there. It works. It's not changing. Uh, but, uh, you know, little things on that change as well. So, you know, you get this brass dial, um, you get a little cutout notch so you can fit a you know, belt box carrier so the belt stays, say, uh, stays in the right place. Loads of innovation, loads of stuff to learn about it. And I think people normally, if they've got it in their living room or in their stuff room, their war room, their war office, whatever they call it, man cave, um, they just scratch the surface of this stuff. And because we can specialize in the Vickers, um, you know, in the way that we do, mm. we, we scratch the surface and we just keep going. Yeah, we, we really, really do. Uh, to the point yeah. that, you know, we, we've got, uh, you know, a, a, another vid that we did perhaps explains it. Um, we had a, a nearly a ton, may, might be more than that, haven't weighed it, of spare parts uh, donated wow. to us recently in the last year. That's amazing. And in those, I think we looked at 280 different crank handles. So you know, 280 of these, um, different markings across many of them. But half of them uh, were all marked CRD, Climax Rock Drill, Cornwall Company. Look in the record books because we look at archives rather than just the physical material. So up to the National Archives, look in the contract ledgers. Um, 200 ordered. Okay. I think it's about 200. We've got 180 of them. And you go, so they weren't oh. needed then, were they? <laughs> no, because no, they don't break. No. These are heavy bits of kit. Yeah, if somebody's yeah. dropped it, they've done the gunning. Um, yeah, you might lose one somehow if you, you lose the pin. But it helps us understand infrastructure. It helps us understand need. We do try and get into that complete in it. Nobody needs to know that in their understanding, the Vickers. Yeah, so what? We wanted, we didn't even want to know it. We didn't even know we needed to want to know it. Mm. Uh, but we found it out anyway, because one day it might tell us a whole story when we get through this ton of parts yeah. um, and we're about two thirds of the way. Uh, yeah, we've only got, I think it's about 3,000 feed block pool springs to go, um, uh, sorting through, checking the markings. And uh, once we understand that, we can understand big picture, macro level data. We realized that the Brit everybody always goes on about Australian parts being on everything. Well, yeah, they were because they were on the guns that came from Australia in, 19 in the early 90s. This, this ton of parts came from the British Army in Donington, and were remarkably untouched um, from the 60s until we've got them. And uh, they've just been sat in different um, firearms dealers sort of sheds. Uh, but there's no Australian parts. So the Australians didn't produce stuff for the Brits. 
everybody thinks they did. You know, until that point, everybody thought they were the big suppliers. They clearly weren't. Uh, yeah. So, it, it, let's say, I, I've sort of waxed on there a little bit. That's but fine. It's sort of just scratching that itch of going, not necessarily, we don't know the question. This is the academic side of things. We don't know what the questions are, but we're going to find the answers anyway. Yeah. Um, and and that, that's a real, nobody's right, going to ever write books or no publisher is ever going to start to commission us to write books about that level of stuff. So we'll probably end up publishing it ourselves. You know? yeah. That's one of the benefits of being an organization with an association and graphic designers and, and people like that volunteering their time to yeah. support us. We'll probably end up publishing some of this stuff ourselves. And if 20 people buy it because they really like the guns as much as we do, so what? It's 20 more people that are educated and informed about the Vickers machine gun. Exactly. And that's the point. That's the entire point of it all, isn't it? You know? Yeah. If one, if one person takes something away, you've done your job. That's Absolutely. what I always yeah. Mm. yeah. Yeah. And we don't need, yeah, we don't need big publishing contracts to support that. We'd no. like some. Um, but, you know, and we're not precious about doing it ourselves. So the, the Haynes Manual uh, on the Vickers machine gun, which, you know, is, is some, probably something worth mentioning. Everybody always gets them for Christmas. Um, we're waiting for the copies to come out in the work, super cheap. Uh, but, you know, we, we, we help support that. Um, mm. And, mm took loads of loads of uh, uh photos for different accessories that were in there that haven't been seen before mm. um because you know nobody's asked for a start and uh, and martin asked us to do uh some additional uh, material for it uh asked us to look at it and, and make sure everything was right so we immediately stripped out that one million round story um and uh you know, try and add more detail wherever we can so we're not precious about doing it ourselves uh, but and we will help other people um, but we do like you know we want to make sure that it's here as a resource and a repository for anybody asking any questions at all anonymously or otherwise um, you know if they don't want to be embarrassed about asking basic questions mm -hmm. uh, then we're not going to name and shame um, no. in any sense of the word but we're yeah. just trying to rebalance uh, you know machine gunnery as this art and science uh, into the whole doctrine of the army um, of the armies around the world, you know, just uploaded the other day a, re a, a gigabyte sized manual for the Portuguese in 1937. Do you want to Amazing. understand about the Portuguese in 1937? That's the manual to go and read. It's in Portuguese, so you have to read the dictionary and you know go and learn some stuff on Duolingo first. But that that's the one to go and read. Um, it doesn't matter, you know, that it's got two mentions of the vicars in there it's valuable information because it tells us the Portuguese had the Vickers in 1937. It of tells course. you what accessories, it tells you the size of their machine gun crews, um, which means you can then understand the differences and things yeah. like that. So yeah. all these tangents, as you've seen sort of the questions that you can ask me a simple question. There's a tangent to go on um, because, because there is, yeah, I, I'm not making it up. They exist. We're just finding them out. And there you have it really. That's what Rich does. And that's, and that's what he'll continue to do. And big thank you to Rich. I'd like to thank him again for appearing on the channel. Link to his channel down below. Go and subscribe. Go and watch some of his stuff. Follow him on Twitter. Do all that good stuff. And uh, like, subscribe to this video and stay tuned for more.